Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Jim Ryan, and I'm the dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our second master class of the year. If you haven't attended a master class before, um, let me explain the basic idea behind it and the way it works. Both are simple. The idea behind the series is to give us a chance to celebrate and examine some of the great teaching that's happening across this university. Each session features a 40 minute or so teaching demonstration after which a facilitator leads a discussion with the master teacher and the audience to pull back the curtain on the lesson and to ask why things were done the way they were done, what choices were made and why. Tonight I'm delighted that Eric Mazur is our master teacher and our own Dick Light is the facilitator. Eric is the Balkansky for Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. In his own words, learning is a social experience. Harvard is Harvard not because of the buildings, not because of the professors, but because of the students interacting with one another. Now, it might seem somewhat unusual for a Harvard professor to say that Harvard is not Harvard because of the professors. And if there were anyone who should make that claim, it's Eric. He is a celebrated teacher and a world-renowned scholar. He has a PhD from the University of Leiden and an honorary, do honorary doctorate from the University of Montreal. He has held appointments at Princeton and Vanderbilt and appointments in Belgium and Hong Kong, and he's a member of not one, but two royal societies. He's consulted in the electronics and telecommunications industries, founded three companies, and received numerous awards for his contributions to optical physics and education. But to turn the clock back to 1990, despite his talents and his accolades, in 1990 he faced a problem in his classroom. His students just weren't getting the material. After months of listening to lectures by one of the most brilliant minds in the field, the students still hadn't grasped, grasped some of the basic concepts of physics. And Eric faced a choice. He could do one of two things. He could do nothing, shrug his shoulders and think it's the student's problem, or he could do something about it, and he chose the latter. One day he asked his class to discuss a problem among themselves, and in a matter of minutes, they had figured out the answer. That moment itself was the birth of a teaching methodology, peer instruction, that Eric has spent more than 20 years developing. The idea of students interacting and learning from one another is at the heart of peer instruction. The approach flips the standard model. It asks students to review and advance information that would have previously been presented as part of a lecture and then prepare questions for class. The instructor poses some of these questions to the students. They try to answer them themselves individually and then talk with each other so that they can see and compare their work. This process forces the students to examine the arguments they have come up with and the arguments that their classmates have developed, and it allows the instructor to assess their understanding in real time. A wealth of research has linked peer instruction to increase student mastery of content across disciplines, and if, with the advent of technology and the ease of delivering information through technology, the use of peer instruction will only become more relevant and more important when we think about how we should best use classroom time. Eric, Eric has shared his work in a 1997 book entitled Peer Instruction, a User's Manual, a 2006 award-winning DVD entitled Interactive Teaching, and his work in turn has been celebrated by others, including in 2014, when he was the first recipient of the Minerva Prize for Advancements in Higher Education, a $500,000 award promoting extraordinary innovation in teaching. The Minerva Academy, along with many others, has recognized peer instruction as a genuine breakthrough, a eureka moment, if you will, in teaching. I'm honored that we'll have a chance to experience this tonight with Eric, and I thank him for joining us. It's also a privilege to be learning tonight alongside our facilitator, Dick Light, the Carl H. Forsheimer Jr. Professor of Teaching and Learning here at the Ed School. 
Dick is an expert in higher education and a phenomenal teacher in his own right. He has been tapped by four Harvard presidents, Presidents Bach, Rudenstein, Summers, and Faust, to explore how to strengthen the undergraduate experience here at Harvard and at other campuses. This work has led to the Harvard assessment, Harvard assessment seminars where Dick has, for many years, led work focused on how faculty members can most effectively help students learn and on encouraging and assessing innovation in the classroom. Thank you to you, thank to you, thanks to you as well, Dick, for joining us tonight. Now, before I hand things over to Eric and Dick, just a few um, quick notes. Uh, Master Class will be going on a holiday hiatus, but mark your calendars for Thursday, February 26th and Thursday, April 2nd. In February, we'll be hosting Dan Levy, a senior lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. And in April, we'll, we'll be delighted to welcome Rakesh Kurana, Dean of Harvard College, and Marvin Bauer, Professor of Leadership Development. And as always, thanks to those who helped put tonight's event together, especially Lori Forcier and Matt Miller, who have asked me to remind you to return your clickers at the conclusion of tonight's event. They are not, I'm sorry to say, souvenirs. Now, please join me in welcoming Eric and Dick. Can you hear? Why don't you yes, just do yes testing, I am. Both Basically of us, good. Works. Just be sure the microphone is, uh, phones are on. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, let me just quickly say what's coming up in terms of structure. Uh, I'm gonna open with just a couple of straightforward questions for Eric, at least I think they're straightforward. And um, then uh, Eric will do his presentation. Then there will be plenty of time for your questions. I'll have, I suspect, a couple to ask when he is finished, but there will be loads of time for you. You all see the two microphones there. So, uh, may I begin? Are you, Absolutely. you ready? Here goes. Uh, now, you, were, you came to Harvard in the early 1980s as a young uh, assistant professor of physics. I'm sure you had your mind mainly on research. Clearly, you got very involved in teaching. That's what you're gonna talk about today. How come? What happened? Well, <laughs> I came actually as a postdoc in uh, 1982. I, uh, I knew one thing with 100% certainty, namely that I was never going to teach. <laughs> Both of my parents were teaching. My father was a, a professor of physics in, uh, at the University of Leiden, and my mother was an art historian also teaching at the university. Um, I knew I was going to do something useful with my life. Um, uh, so I embarked on a path to go into industry. I lined up a job in, uh, at Philips in Eindhoven. And, um, and then my father, I, I had not yet defended my thesis, but I had this job already lined up. My father said, why don't you take a one-year postdoc in the US? And I had never been here, so I thought that might be a good idea. So I wrote to a number of universities. Harvard was one of them. And uh, I called up Phillips, I said, is it okay if I postpone my acceptance for one year and I, uh, and I uh, learn more about working with lasers in the US? And they thought it was a great idea. So I came here as a postdoc and one year became a second year. I, I called Phillips that second year to ask them if it was okay to stay another year. I don't know if they're still waiting for me. <laughs> um, and after two years I was offered an assistant professorship and um, you know, I titled my, my, my talk Confessions because there are a couple of confessions. And the first one is that when I started teaching, I, um, I never asked myself, you know, I, I mainly accepted the assistant professorship because I thought it's a way of, ex I was enjoying the, the, my life here in Cambridge and I was enjoying the research I was doing. And I thought it's just a way of extending my, my postdoc another couple of years since, you know, not many people received tenure at that time at Harvard. I thought, you know, it's, it's just a way of, you know, without many obligations. But I had to teach, so that was my first v venture into the classroom. And um, as I started teaching, I never asked myself the question, how am I going to teach? You know, when you do something new in your career, that, that should really be the first question you ask yourself. It didn't even come up in my mind. It was perfectly clear what I was going to do. I was going to do to my students what my teachers had done to me. 
Here's actually a picture of me teaching as, a, as an assistant professor. It's a very old picture. It was taken BC, before computers. <laughs> um, you see, I'm still using an overhead projector there. Um, and you know what happened to make matters worse was that I very quickly received feedback that I was doing the right thing. What are the ways by which we typically evaluate the quality of teaching? Well, I can think of two of them. One is the end of semester questionnaire. Well, I was asked to teach the class that none of my colleagues wanted to teach. Physics for pre-meds. You know, these students were not taking physics because they wanted to take physics, no. They were taking physics because they had to in order to get into medical school. And most of them already hated physics before setting foot in my classroom. Now, most of my teachers didn't want, most of my colleagues didn't want to teach it because the end of semester evaluations were not very kind. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, they, they would come close to committing suicide at the end of the term when they saw the result of the end of semester evaluation. But not so for me, I got a 4.5 out of five. So clearly the students liked what I was doing in front of the classroom. Not only that, but I could give them really hard problems on the examination, problems that were so hard I wasn't quite sure that I would be able to solve them under the time pressure of an exam. So they liked me, they did well on the exam. Very quickly I started to believe that I was the world's best physics teacher. So what happened, Derek? Well, you know, <laughs> I should have seen the writing on the, raw, on the, on the wall very early on, you know. Because in spite of giving me high ratings, some students would write at the bottom of their questionnaires, physics is boring. So they would give me a high rating and then they would write physics is boring or physics sucks. I never could make any sense of that. I thought, you know, how can they like me as an instructor? And how can they not like the beauty of doing science. I mean, what is more beautiful than understanding how the world around us works? Same thing when I go to a party and people ask me what I do for a living, and I tell them I'm a physicist, you know. <laughs> I get these uh, looks, oh, I had such a hard time with physics in high school or in college. Uh, you know, it always makes me feel embarrassed. And I never really understood where that was coming from. In any case, what happened, as Dean Ryan described was that somewhere in the very early 90s, I think it was about 1990, I had taught, this was the seventh year or so that I was teaching, I came across an instrument, basically 30 multiple choice questions, to measure whether or not students understood Newton's third law. Newton's third law is F equals M, no sorry, it's F12 equals F21. You may have heard it as action is reaction, or the force of object one on object two is equal in magnitude to the force exerted by object two and object one when they interact. Well, it turns out that if you replace one by heavy truck and two by light car, students forget everything about Newton's third law. So on this instrument, for example, there's a question that asks, consider a heavy truck and a light car colliding head on on the highway. Is the force exerted by the light car on the heavy truck larger than that of the heavy truck on the light car, small, smaller than, or are they equal? As I said, you know, according to Newton's third law, they're equal, but intuitively most students answer, and I thought only before they had taken physics, that the heavier object exerts a larger force on the lighter objects. Well, I read about the results that had been obtained with this instrument, and I thought, no way, not my students. But you know, I'm a scientist, so one of the things I've learned is not to make, not to rely on anecdotal evidence. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to show that in my class at Harvard, things are very different. So we were close to the end of the semester. We had done Newton's third law in the first week of the semester. And of course, it comes back over and over and over again. And I, I gave this, this quiz, as I called it, to my students. Um, and within five minutes, I tumbled out of my ivory tower. One student raised her hand. I walked over to her. And she asked me, Professor Mazur, how should I answer this question? According to what you taught us? Or according to the way I usually think about these things? 
I had no idea how to answer that question. And, and by the end of that quiz, I'd been dragged out of my ivory tower. And it was very clear that uh, my student hadn't mastered even the most fundamental concept. So how did you, um, as a result of this, change your approach to teaching? Yes, yeah, so a little prelude to that, perhaps. Um, perhaps, you know, at that point, I, I started to ask myself, what is going on, right? I mean, I could clearly not blame the students, right? Sometimes you think, well, the students are just, you know, not smart enough, but, you know, we have Harvard students here. So there was an argument that didn't hold up. The other problem could have been the teacher, but that was me. And I got high evaluation. I was the world's best physics teacher, so that couldn't be true either. So put yourself in my position. What would you have said? What, what is another option, just out of curiosity? What? Come on. Somebody speak up. Put yourself in my position. You've given this test. Students do very poorly. You cannot really blame the students. The test, exactly. There had to be something wrong with this test. But then I did some testing of my own by basically comparing word-based questions with formula-based questions, and I found that the students could, could manipulate the equations without any difficulty, but the word questions, they couldn't answer. They clearly had not understood the basic principles. So then I thought, you know, what is it exactly that happens in a, in a lecture? Let's take this picture of me, uh, me uh, delivering a lecture here. I would like you to actually describe this process that is on the screen there it was a verb, ideally, but the, the, the two verbs I do not want to hear are learning and, and teaching. So blurt it out. I'll repeat it so that the, the audience that is remote can hear it too. So go ahead. What's going on there on the screen? Sitting. Sitting. Observing. 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 Listening. Listening. Sleeping. Sleeping? <laughs> These are my students. You know, I had anticipated that you would say that. I don't know you. Maybe we'll talk after the uh, after talk. But I can't resist quoting uh, the French writer Albert Camus, who once said, "Some people talk in their sleep. Lecturers talk while other people are sleeping." <laughs> okay. Anyway, look, they have their heads straight, so they're not sleeping. So. Let's, let's hear some more words, because all of the words we've heard deal only with the students, but I'm there too. I'm definitely not sleeping in front of the class, nor am I observing. Demonstrating, Demonstrating but that's only me, not the students. Is there a way that we can capture the whole process? Thinking. 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 We would hope so, but... Mimicking. Mimicking. Okay. Presenting. Presenting, but that's me again. Can we capture both the students and me in the process? Communicating, but you see, when I think about communicating, I think about something going back and forth, like we're doing now, and in most classrooms that doesn't happen, right? I mean, broadcasting, very good. What is being broadcasted? Information. Information. That's when I realized that in a lecture, you actually focus on the transfer of information, but education is so much more than just the transfer of information. And I found out that the result of just transferring information was lack of learning, as evidenced by these test results, and lack of retention. You test students two months after the end of a one-semester physics course, and they're back to where they were at the beginning of the semester. So what good is it even to do this? So for a while, I thought, you know, Eric, uh, you know, it's clear that you're not such a good teacher as you thought. Um, maybe you should teach graduate courses. But uh, I, wasn't giving, I wasn't willing to give up that quickly, and it turns out that the solution presented itself serendipitously, completely serendipitously. You see, I was, um, I was shocked by these results of the FCI, but the students were just as shocked that they'd done poorly. And they had a midterm examination coming up, so they were worried. And they asked me for a special session where I would explain everything about every question. So I booked a, a, a room in a, in, a, in a science center, the biggest classroom there. My, my, my class was 250 students then. 
and I went through every single question on this, this instrument, this force concept inventory as it is called. And when I got to this question of the heavy truck and the car, to me that was an easy question. I couldn't actually even understand how students answered it incorrectly. So I made a drawing of the car, of the truck, I drew the forces of gravity, the forces up from the road, and then the force of the truck on the car and the car on the truck, and I said, by Newton's third law, these two forces are equal. What's, what more is there to explain about it? I turn around, because I'd been with my back to the students, and I could see at once from their faces that they were confused. So I said, is there a question? They were so confused, they could not even articulate a question. I thought, this is serious. So you know, I thought, maybe I should bring in more you know, equations and formalism. Maybe they're confused by the fact that the truck is less affected by the collision than the car. So I thought I'm going to explain that was Newton's second law. So I erased the board. I started all over again. And after eight minutes, the entire board was covered with equations and drawings. I, I gave the most brilliant explanation you could possibly imagine. At the end of eight minutes, I turn around, you know, my coat jacket covered in chalk dust, triumphantly thinking I'd nailed it only to see that they looked even more confused. And they could still not articulate a question. I didn't know what to do. I, I had no idea what to do. And in a moment of despair, I knew that 50% had given the right answer. So in a moment of despair, I said to them, why don't you discuss it with each other? And something happened I had never seen in my classroom, complete chaos broke out. They all started talking. They, f they forgot about me in front of the class. I mean, I could have gone away. They would not even have noticed it. And in two minutes, they figured it out. I thought, how can this be? I, the expert, spent 10 minutes unsuccessfully explaining it to them. And in just two minutes, they, they figure it out. Imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, Mary and John. Mary has the right answer. John does not. On average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply by the force of logic. But here's the key point. Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she has only recently learned it. She still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Whereas Professor Mazur learned it such a long time ago. To him, it's so trivial that he cannot remember what the difficulties are. You cannot even you know, imagine what the difficulties are that the beginning learner has. We forget how we learned. Things become second nature. So I went, wow, that's amazing. And I should really do this in my classroom. So the next year, I decided to basically change my approach radically. Because it's not the transfer of information that's the key. What is really the key is making sense of that information. Right? Where, think about your own classes. Where did the aha moments occur? Where did things click and come into place? Was it while you were sitting in a room like this one, listening to your instructor speak? Probably not. Probably it was when you're doing homework or reviewing your notes that you went, oh, now I figured it out. So I like to think of of education as a two-step process. The first one is information transfer, right? No information transfer, no education. We, we need that. But we live in the information age, so it's not necessary to do that the way they had to do it in the Middle Ages, when they, before Gutenberg invented the printing press by just you know, reading the book and have everybody in the audience be scribes. But that's not enough. We need that second step, making sense of the information. In the traditional approach to teaching, step one takes place in class, and step two is left to the students on their own outside of class. And I think if you think about it, it's step two that's the hardest part. So we should really have the teacher present during that step two. I didn't call it the flipped classroom. I, I didn't come up with that term. But I said we should really invert the sequence. And instead of doing one in the class and two at home, we should focus on that second step. So I basically said, okay, 
the students are going to be responsible for the information transfer outside of the class, so that in class I can do more meaningful uh, things. Now, it was the flipped class movement that has started in the past 10 years. There's been a lot of discussion of the out-of-class component. To me, that's not the important thing. To me, that's the trivial part, the information transfer. So the question I'd like to address here is, what do you do in the class if the students have been res are responsible for the uh, information transfer outside of the class? And basically, the answer to that question is it's very simple. And it's nothing new at all. The answer is, let's teach by questioning rather than by telling. Who said that first? Socrates, more than 2,000 years ago, and here we are still mostly teaching by telling all around the, the world. So I come into class and I teach by questioning. I pose a question, I, let the st I give the students an opportunity to think. You see, in a lecture, normally you cannot think, right? There's no time to think, because you're listening. In a sense, you're held captive by the speaker. I'm holding you captive right now. If you start thinking, you're daydreaming, your thoughts wander, and our brains are simply not wired to multitask, so you're not listening anymore as you're thinking. You can maybe think very superficially and quickly, but to really think, hmm, how does this work? There's no time for it. And I don't know about you, but I've never had a student in my class raise his hand and say, Professor Mazur, could you please be quiet for 10 minutes? I need to think. <laughs> it's never happened. So there's no opportunity to think in a class. But here there is, because I pose the question, and then they think. And after they think, I poll them. I poll them so that there's a commitment. We'll talk about that in, in just a second. Initially, I did it with a show of hands. Then the clicker was introduced. Now we actually use consumer devices to do that. Then I tell them, now turn to a neighbor I mean, provided more than 30% have the right answer, right? Because if the percentage of correct answers is too low, then you can have them talk as much as you want to each other. They're never going to get anywhere. Also, if the percentage of right answers is too high, it's not going to work either because they're going to be off task very quickly. So ideally, you want the question so that between 30 and 70% get it correct. I ask them to turn to a neighbor who has a different answer. I tell them if the one on your left has the same answer as you gave, say thank you very much, you turn to the person on the right. If everybody around you has the same answer, get up and walk around. Find somebody who has a different answer and try to convince that person that you are right and he or she is wrong. Then pull them again, typically with a much increased number of correct responses. And then I explain, or I have one of the students explain it, and then that cycle basically repeats until the end of the class. And of course, the key um, part of this is this discussion. That's where the students actually learn. Let me show you a little video of how this works in practice, and then we'll do it, because that's part of this master class, right? So we have a rectangular loop. So I, uh, the sound is field a field in the oh. direction indicated by these So arrows. I read the question with the so students. So the question is, what are the magnetic forces on the four different sides? D of this don't worry loop. about the question, okay? So I won't be examining you on about that. This and then enter your answers. They think for about a minute or two, and it's quiet. I don't want them to talk to each other. They Please enter your answers. I can see on my screen what they answer. Uh, I do not share that with the students. Disagreement clearly here. So turn to your neighbor and see if you can convince one another of the correct choice. Right. It goes out of the page and on the top it goes in, so right. they cancel each other out. There is a torque. There is a torque. How do you know that? I said torque. What did you think? But how could it be a torque? Notice the aha moment there. Oh. That's Initially, we had sort of rewarding things, these aha moments in the classroom. And now we have an absolutely overwhelming majority for choice number two. The bottom and of that second distribution, I do show that to them, so they see the, the second that? distribution. So what's going on here? One is, it's active learning, not passive. It's impossible to sleep through my classes because every few minutes your neighbor will start talking to you. The second thing, it's a two-way flow of information, right? It's not only from me to the students, there's information coming back. And if they don't understand it, I see it then and there when I can still do something about it. I don't have to wait till the exam or any type of assessment. 
The last thing is that it's continuous formative assessment. Right? The students continuously get to test out their own knowledge without any penalty. And people have shown, you know, and I'm, I'm sure most of you know this, about that, that formative assessment is so incredibly important, much more important actually than summative assessment. Lastly, it sort of personalizes the instruction, right? Because student A can address student B's problem, but student C can address student D's problem, and the two problems don't have to be the same. So even if you have a class of 250, it personalizes the instruction. Do you want to try it? Really? Okay. Did you all read about, um, I, I had a handout on thermal expansion? No? I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you know what that means? That means that I will have to lecture you about thermal expansion. And actually I'm really happy because I don't get to lecture very often in my own classes, so. <laughs> So thermal expansion, oh, by the way, before we do that, we need to briefly talk about these uh, clickers. <clears throat> They're on, you don't have to turn them on. And um, um, you just press the button that corresponds to, uh, to the choice you want to make. So if you think the answer is four, you press four. And if you change your mind, you press whatever other button. You can always change your mind. That doesn't mean you get to vote twice. If you vote four first and then five, the five erases the four. Okay, each clicker gets only one voice. And you can see, as you push a button, you can see the little display displaying that number. That means that my computer has registered what you have voted. This is what I see. I have this tiny little window here that floats that, um, oh, 18 of you have already been playing with your clickers. Very good. <laughs> you can see the number of people. Why don't you all go and, 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 and click away? Okay, so you can see that the number goes up here. 30, 33, we have many more, so everybody, why don't you just, there's no, nothing is gonna happen, you know, and there's no credit for it, this won't affect your salary or anything, don't worry. <laughs> At any point, I can click on this uh, little thing and see the distribution of answers. A lot of you like button number five, apparently. Why, why don't you all press one now? Go ahead, press one. Oh, I love it when my audiences follow my instruction. <laughs> and you see that, instantaneously the distribution changes. As soon as I hit this stop button here, it freezes. So now if you push a button, you see on the little window a circle with a line. You can no longer wait. Polling is closed. Now, there are a number of people who are remotely connected, and if you're remotely connected, you can go with any consumer device to rwpoll.com and uh, then enter the session ID number um, emazur, and then you should actually see a display that um, looks very much like a clicker. So let's see, no, not click here. Let's actually see if there are people who are remotely participating. So let's start a new poll. So at this point, I would like the people who are remotely connected to just enter a random answer. I'll do the same thing here just to make sure that it works. Okay. Three. Okay, it might take a little bit of time for people to get on. Okay, there you go. There they go. So these are the people who are not here in, in the room, but who are remote, uh, connected remotely. Okay, good. Thank you. So I know that at least some people around the globe who are, uh, who are logged in are also participating. Let's see if they have a preference. There was no question, of course, yet, but you know. Okay, good. So let's get started here and talk about uh, thermal expansion briefly. Thermal expansion is, um, is a phenomenon that's very important in engineering and uh, in uh, you know, science in general. Thermal expansion means, and, and we're going to only talk about hard solids like steel or metals or wood or stone, not soft things, only hard things. So all hard materials expand, they get larger in volume when it gets hotter, and they shrink again when it gets colder. When hot, they expand, cold shrink. If you've ever taken a train at uh, low velocity, you hear this clickety-clack sound of the wheels when it goes over the gaps between the sections of the rail. And you may wonder, why don't they jam the sections together? Well, if they were to jam the sections together, if the rail expands, there's no room for it to expand, bad things happen. No buckle and the train will derail. 
Likewise, for steel beam buildings, this is not a steel beam buildings, but for large towers, you have to take into account the expansion of the metal. Next time you park your car in a large parking structure, like uh, the concrete parking structure at Logan, for example, as you walk out of your car, look down. You will see that every 30 yards or so, there's a, a gap that has been filled with rubber. It's not just one big concrete slab. No, it's different slabs. It's rubber in between to allow the concrete to expand when it gets hotter. So it's an important thing in engineering. The reason that hard materials expand is because it's made from atoms, as everything else. Typically in a solid, the atoms are in a fixed position, and they're holding their neighbors in a fixed pattern. And when it gets hotter, the atoms get further away from each other. So this is cold, and this is hot. Cold and hot. That's all there is to it. Now, I'm not going to examine you on this, but you may wonder why is it that the atoms get further away from each other? Well, it is because atoms don't sit still, they vibrate. And the amplitude of that vibration is related to what we call temperature. So this is cold and this is hot. So you basically imagine you're an atom, right? You wouldn't sit there like this, you would actually be shaking. And as things heat up, you would shake more, pushing people around you away because you need more space. The atoms essentially need more space. And it's not just the nine that are on the screen there, it's all of them, the millions of billions of atoms that make up a solid. Okay, so cold and hot. Any questions? I knew I was a good teacher. <laughs> Thank you very much for reaffirming that. <laughs> but look, I'm not going to simply black out the screen and then ask you a question like, when materials expand, the atoms in the material get A, further away from each other, B, stay in distance, C, get close together, because that would be simply me transferring information to you and you regurgitating that same information back to me. That would not be interesting. I'm gonna take this, this idea of the atoms getting further away from each other, all of them, and then see if you can apply this idea in a new context. So you better ask me questions. Cold? Yeah, and odd. Why do they need more space? They need more space because what we call temperature is actually related to the vibration, the energy associated with these atoms. Atoms don't sit still, they shake. When you heat something up, you basically add energy through which they shake more. So when you touch an object, you essentially feel this energy associated with the oscillation of the atoms. So as they get hotter, they oscillate over a bigger amplitude and they need more space because, you know, they need more space to go left and right. Yes? So if they're oscillating over a bigger space, aren't there times in which they're actually closer together and then further apart? Yeah, but, but the equilibrium position, if you want, the middle, one, the middle position, right, because you have to be able to get closer, you, you push the, the equilibrium position away from the neighbors. Very good question. Any other questions? Cold and hot in the back. Okay, now we're getting into astrophysics. I mean, this is way, way, way beyond. Let's talk after the talk about this. But this is irrelevant for, for the question. It has to deal with the gravitational energy that pulls this, all the material of the sun, <coughs> since the sun is so big, in yielding the energy for, for the temperature, which is completely correct, but I don't want to get into that tangent. Yes? So you said they have to go left and right directions? It's random. Different atoms will vibrate into different directions. Yeah. Ah, very good question. So I think that's actually the question I'm going to ask. Um, so I think you're ready for the question. Here is the question. Consider a rectangular metal plate with a circular hole in it. When the plate is uniformly heated, what happens to the diameter of that hole? Does it increase? Does it stay the same? 
Oh, look at that. People have started answering. I haven't even read the question yet. Does it decrease? So I'm going to give you a minute and a half to think about this. Don't talk. If you talk to your neighbor, I'm going to come with this microphone. You're going to have to tell everybody what you just told your neighbor, okay? So... And if you've already voted, if you're among the 25 smart people who already made up their minds, ask yourself, how am I going to convince somebody else that I am right and he or she is wrong? So think about how you would articulate your reasoning. Okay, 30 seconds left. Fifteen. So by now, if you have not, no idea, you're still hesitating between two, make it a game, okay? As I said, there, there, nothing depends on, on the answer you give. You're not going to get credit for it, nor will you get any penalty for getting it wrong. So, plus it's anonymous, so just enter an answer, make a choice, and once you've made a choice... I want you to find a neighbor around you who has a different answer. You can walk around if you want, it's fine. But you have to be talking to someone. If I see people who are not talking, I'm going to come and talk to you, okay? <laughs> so go ahead. Try to convince one another that you're right and the other person is wrong. Yes? No, he's just going to say, I think you're doing great. I'm, I'm timing. It's totally yep, your we're almost but done. No, yeah, but no, don't rush. I mean, I think yeah. if, uh, if you're yeah. done at five-ish, that's yeah. fine. We're good. We'll be done in five minutes. Oh, and if yeah. it's 14 minutes, that's fine, too. We're good. And I've got a few good questions, and then we'll open it. Good. Do you think it will decrease the diameter of the Why is it? Outside. You might want to say that. That'll make everyone. Well, you've got. But I don't know what it is now. You've got your engagement. I think the rain, it has to be like this, right? Yes. That's the Yes. Okay. Right. So, even though it looks like the rain gets bigger, but maybe the inside, like this, this circle gets smaller. Perhaps it could be like this. I mean, the space. Now look at that. 
you all got fired up. Okay, I'm sure that by now many of you, hello, it's okay. There are still people sitting there. It's okay. Everybody's gesticulating like this and like that. I'm sure that by now many of you have forgotten that I am not here to talk about thermal expansion. I'm here to talk about education. The answer to this question doesn't even matter because you already made my point how, you know, engaging it is compared to a standard lecture. But I'm sure many of you would like to know what the answer is. Now, before I'm going to tell you the answer, let's analyze what, what happened here. I asked you a question, and then uh, after I'd asked you the question, you had to make a commitment by pushing that button. And after you made a commitment, I asked you to turn to a neighbor, and you had to externalize that, that answer. You had to you know, go to somebody else and say, this is what I answered. And something interesting happened. Even though I remain on the stage here, I could see it from a distance. All of a sudden, you moved away from the answer to the reasoning. It was no longer just about the answer. I chose, hmm, because blah, 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 blah. In a sense, it brings the reasoning back into the classroom. It's not about the answer. In fact, later in life, when we're solving problems, it's never about the outcome. When you solve a problem, you usually know what the desired outcome is. It's how you get there that is important. This is a way of bringing that back into the classroom. It's not the answer that's important. It's the reasoning that's important. But most of all, you became emotionally invested in the learning process. If I were to tell you, or if Dick were now to interrupt me and say, Eric, this is all the time I'm going to give you, or I, and I walk away, you would come running after me asking what the answer is. So Eric, what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, before I can tell you the answer, you need to vote a second time. So please enter what you currently believe to be the correct answer. Even if you've not changed your mind, even if you have not changed your mind, you have to vote again. So, right, let's say you chose four, which is not an answer, and you still think it's four, you press four again. I need everybody to vote a second time. Okay, well, Dick, I got some bad news. What's the bad news, Eric? The bad news is that only 20% of you got it right the first time. You know, in a sense, you made the point that I wanted to make. Because, in a sense, you've been telling me, Eric, your lecturing sucks. <laughs> no, you know what the real reason is? You should have done your reading before coming to class. <laughs> Anyway, when they're 20% correct, then the method doesn't work that well, right? Because that means that only one of every five, and the groups are smaller than five, has the correct answer. So it tends to go the wrong way when it's less than, than 50%. Um, so what is the right answer? Look at that. Look at everybody. There's not a single person tweeting or texting or what. Everybody's looking at me. The right answer is can I get a drum roll here? <laughs> the right answer is number one. Ah, look at that. Everybody. Now, let's see, let's, let's quickly have a look at the distribution. I'm, I'm very worried here. Oh, well, look at that, that's pretty amazing. Even though initially, what is it, 18% got it right? It went up, the right answer went up at the expense of the other two answers. So it went in the right direction, but because there were so few of you, next time do your reading before you come to class, okay? Now, you know, again, I'm sure that by now many of you have forgotten that I'm here to talk about about teaching, but I don't want you to lie in bed tonight at 2 a.m. thinking, why is the hole getting larger? <laughs> well, um, imagine you have a jar of jam in the refrigerator. You take it out of the refrigerator, you can't open the cover. It's a glass jar, 
glass doesn't expand that much. Metal lid, which is basically a ring with a plate. And you can't open it. What do you do? You run it under hot water. The ring expands, the hole gets larger. You said, well, that's a jar. I mean, you asked about a metal plate. Okay. <laughs> Imagine we take a metal plate. No hole in it. There's no hole. We draw a circle on it. Now we put this plate in the oven. We turn up the temperature and the plate expands. What happens to the diameter of the circle that we've drawn? It gets bigger too. Everything gets bigger, so the circle has to get bigger too. You said, that's unfair. <laughs> There's no hole in the plate. If there was a hole, then the atoms would expand into the hole. Well, let me show you what's wrong with that. Imagine we go all outside in the grass behind this uh, room, and we form a big circle holding hands. We are the atoms at the edge of the hole. Now we step in towards the center of the hole. What just happened to the distance between us? It got smaller. It can't get smaller because our neighbor and ourselves too are just shaking more. The only way to make the distance between us bigger would be to remove a few of us, but atoms don't disappear like that, or to make the circle bigger. You won't forget this. <laughs> okay, so very quickly, um, what I was able to show right in the first year that I used this is that I, I was able to double the learning gains. In fact, they tripled once I got better questions to ask in class and also much longer retention. I've never looked back. Great. Um, <laughs> should I do my questions here? Yeah. Get my microphone, it's on, good. Um, just quickly, I'm going to uh, do a couple of quick hitters, Eric, if I may. Quick questions, brief answers, and then let's open it up. Good? First question. A whole lot of people in this audience come from the world of K-12 through teaching. You, um, most of your work, I think, has been focused on undergraduates. You come to work every day at Harvard, so understandably Harvard undergraduates. Question. Do you, do you know of, do you have any feeling for it, do you have any evidence about K-12 through learning using this technique? Absolutely. In fact, I've spoken to many, many school districts uh, around the country. And um, if you look at the Peer Instruction Network, which is a social network for Peer Instruction users, there are quite a few K-12 uh, uh, teachers who are using it. I was first thinking it would be mostly high schools. After all, if you look, if you would have walked into this classroom 10 minutes ago while you were talking to each other and observed this chaos, I mean, it would have been not that different from the chaos in a kindergarten uh, class. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to turn my classroom into a kindergarten, right? Because small kids take ownership of their learning, right? Mm -hmm. they, they do that automatically. And then somehow, as kids progress, by the time they're in middle school, they no longer take that ownership of learning. So I'm trying to bring that back into the classroom. So I, I've spoken for, for many uh, uh, audiences, including elementary school teachers, and always been surprised at the uh, reception I, I got. I've even spoken for audiences of corporate trainers. And that made me really nervous. If somebody asked me to address an event where there were, you know, trainers for United Airlines, Southwest Airlines, uh, pharmaceutical industries, and so on, I thought, how can I and what I do at Harvard resonate with them? But they were incredibly excited, which made me realize that learning is learning is learning. It doesn't matter what the context is. When you're teaching a purser or a flight attendants uh, at an airline, it's, you know, they need to think on their feet. If there's an emergency, the emergency is likely to be different from the emergencies that are discussed in their manuals. They need to think on their feet and take decisions. It's not about memorizing what happens in this, in this event and what happens in that event. You need to think regardless of the environment. So this really works all across the educational Good. spectrum. Next question. You used examples from physics. That's your field, entirely uh, uh, understandable. Um, do you have any inkling what, uh, whether this might work well in other disciplines? You know, history, sociology, wh whatever it is. Absolutely, Dick. In fact, you know, if you would have asked this question uh, seven or eight years ago, I would have thought, I don't know. I mean, 
you know, in physics, you have right and wrong answers, but in, mm -hmm. in sociology, history, art history, you name it, you don't. But still, you're thinking. You might not have right and wrong answers, but you still have critical thinking. Let's say you teach art history. Well, I mean, and you're discussing uh, Renaissance art in Italy. Botticelli, the birth of Venus. Botticelli is long dead. We cannot drag him out of his grave to ask him, why did you paint that little detail on the painting? As an art historian, you could just project the birth of Venus and then pr present the different theories about why Botticelli painted certain details and then have the students take notes. Why not make the students think like an art historian and ask for their opinion and have them commit to it and then argue to each other and then uh, vote again? You know, in fact, I discovered that because I was giving a talk at, at Strathclyde University in Glasgow about eight years ago and after my, in the physics department. And after my talk in the physics department, a woman walked up to me and she said, um, I bought your book and I started using it in my classes. I always get very nervous when it happens because I, I, I'm worried they'll punch me in the face because it didn't work. But, so I said, and? And she said, oh, it's marvelous. It works so well. So, so I asked her, what do you teach? expecting her to be a physicist. French drama. I said, French drama? I could not imagine how you could use it, but I already gave you the reason. In any environment where there's an interpretation or, or, or a mental model, as in physics, this method lends itself perfectly, as long as it's not rote memorization. And I think none of us really want to teach, teach rote memorization. This is good. I have just one more question, and we'll open it up. Um, I read some things you've written, and I noticed a magic sentence, um, because I actually teach about assessment in my classes. Um, it's, you wrote, assessment is the silent killer of learning. Do I have that roughly right? Totally right. Totally right. Good. My question is, in all seriousness, how do you know what your students are learning? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, was, I was wondering why you were, I, I was thinking you might ask me why I, I used that phrase. Okay. Um, so, that's a good question. And, and, and you have to assess in a meaningful way. Um, in fact, in the last few years, I've started to really focus on assessment. I realized that I'd been spending my entire career changing the approach in the classroom, but my students' study behavior was still completely driven by the assessment. Students study to pass the test. They don't study to learn. That was rubbed in my face, actually, a few years ago. I was boarding a flight in New York to, to go to Buenos Aires. And I sat down in my seat, and next to me was a young woman who had just taken, uh, who had just uh, graduated from the University of Chicago, and we started talking. And she told me that she was working for a cloud-based education company. Well, I had, uh, I just started learning catalytics, which is a cloud-based uh, education company, so I thought, I better find out what she does. Turns out, her company was making flashcards for smartphones. I, I almost rolled my eyes because I don't place a high value on, on, on memorization. You know, so you get a question and you press a button and it gives you the answer. Now, just a week before, I'd attended a talk at the Hill Symposium by Reddy Rodinger, who is a psychologist at Washington University who studies memory and he studies retention from studying with flashcard. And in a paper that he wrote in 2010, which was quoted widely, including the New York Times and Science Magazine, he showed that if you have students study with flashcards and then you test them a few days after, they still memorize a lot of information, but they still remember a lot of information. But if you test them a week later, they only remember 35%. And if you test them two weeks later, you can't even measure anything you know, meaningful. I thought she should know that. So I pulled out my iPad out of my briefcase and pulled up that paper and I gave her the iPad. She looked at it for no more than 10 seconds and then handed me back my iPad. And she looked me right in the eyes and she said, but we only guarantee that they will pass the test. I never thought about it that way, right? And, and, and so I really think you need to test differently than the standard assessment. Last year in December, I don't know if you remember, there was a bomb scare during examination period. 
early December. I was actually in Hong Kong. I turned on at night, I turned on TV, I see the science center and other buildings, fire trucks. There was a student who didn't, I don't know if you remember, who didn't want to take, didn't want to take the exams, who called in a couple of bombs in three different buildings, Seaver, the science center, I forgot what the third one was. Anyway, within two hours, I got an email which was sent out to the entire community. You may have received it too, the students and the faculty from the dean who were saying that he had decided to postpone the exams that were given in those buildings for two days. And he realized that that was a problem because the students had studied for the exam. Wait a minute. You study for the exam and there's only two days during which you remember the information and it's gone? Shouldn't you study for life? I, <laughs> the irony of it, right? So I, I really changed my approach to assessment. We don't have time to really get into the details, but if you type in the silent killer of learning, there's a talk on YouTube that, that gives my, uh, my approach to okay, teaching. Okay, so the answer will come on YouTube, seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, one, I can lift the veil a little bit. One is, you know, to give people access to information because later on, we have access to information, right? When I, if I write a paper on nanophotonics, there's not somebody standing next to me saying, hey, Eric, you're not allowed to look up that paper by your colleague at Yale. You should have known that by heart. I can look up whatever I want, whenever I want it. I can consult whoever I want, whenever I want. It's not about memorizing the information and regurgitation, it's about using the information. So why not give our students access to all the information? In fact, it forces you higher up Bloom's taxonomy. You, you, you cut the bottom layer remembering out. It's, it, you have to test a higher skill in that, in that case. This is good. May I invite questions from the audience? I hope several of you would like to uh, ask Eric some good ones. And you see the microphones. Please just, uh, could you just briefly give your name and any affiliation you care to share and sure. just ask your question. Sorry, Eric, I'm you're super you're eager. Uh, my name is Rina Deshpande. I'm an MBE student uh, here at Hugsy. HGSE, for those of us who don't call it um, First of all, thank you so much. I'm actually a teacher and a teacher of teachers, and I'm actually interested in the concept of rigor with this idea of flipped instruction, whether it's a computer giving direct instruction first, and then we build upon it as instructors um, versus, like, or the same way that you just did with a brief lecture and then building upon it. So how, how do you decide what that direct instruction should be um, and at what level it should be to consider that kind of the, the base, the transformation of, or the transfer of information before you get into your higher order question. Yes, yeah, thank you for that question, excellent question. So it's really about, I, I, I had that slide with a two-step approach to education, right? Transfer of information one, and then what do you do in the classroom? if you've transferred the information in order to help students assimilate the information. I think Piaget would probably have said accommodate the information rather than assimilate the information. So I glossed that, I, I shoved that first step under the, under the rug. Um, so you have to tie the two together, right? Essentially, I, wanted, tr I want to try to accomplish outside of the classroom what I normally accomplished inside the classroom. One way would simply be to videotape your lectures one year and then put them on the web and have students watch the lecture. I mean, what would you lose by doing that? What would you lose by taking a lecture and putting it, other than losing your job, what would you lose? <laughs> what would you lose? Some well, I mean, I've watched some TED Talks, which I think are incredibly uh, uh, inspiring, spontaneous, so I, I, I don't think so. Your own sense of control as a student or as a, as a faculty member? Hmm, I, I, I don't know, but it's not about my control, it's really about the students, right? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, the resistance to it, exactly. But from an educational point of view, what would we lose? Some people say we would lose interaction, but let's face it, how much interaction is there really in a lecture, right? I mean, you see all these lectures here on campus, lecture and then stop and say, does anybody have a question? <laughs> you know, and, and if you wait, 30 seconds, nothing happens, right? So you don't lose any interaction. So you would not lose very much by just putting it on the, on the web. However, if you look at viewing habits of students with video, you find that 
they have a tendency to just watch the first five minutes and then stop or put the play, playback speed at one and a half times. One advantage of watching video is that you could pause it and think, right? which you can't do in a, lec in a, in a live lecture. You can't, you can't stop the instructor or ask the instructor to repeat the last 30 minutes. You, you, nobody does that. Right? Online, you could do that. However, the viewing habits are rather depressing. What you find is that students increase the playback speed which means they have even less opportunity to think, right? Or they watch the first 10 minutes and then think, I know it, or, right, and, and stop. So instead, I like, I prefer to give my students something to read beforehand. Because when you read, you regulate the flow of information, right? If you read a book and you don't understand something, you don't continue reading. You stop and you stare and you think, maybe make a doodle, whatever. And then you pick it up again, or you reread a paragraph. You regulate. You are, as a learner, you're in control of that, that information transfer. So we use a social document annotation system. There's still quite a few bugs to work out, but I think it's a step in the right direction. So basically, the students annotate the text, and they see each other's annotations. Right? So if they don't understand something, they can highlight it and say, I don't understand why, blah, blah, blah. And then another person reading it in the electronic text sees a faint highlight, can click on it and say, oh, that's because of blah, 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 blah. So it's an asynchronous peer instruction if you want. Before class, I look at all of the annotations from the entire class. And I can see, it's sort of like lifting the veil of, you know, in the minds of the students because I see where they had the most questions and I see where there are still unresolved questions. And I use that to tailor the questions that I ask in class. The questions I ask in class are often a result of the questions that the students ask before the class. Right? So that, that gives, certain, in a certain sense, that gives an intrinsic motivation to do the reading because as a student you discover, if I do the reading and I tell Professor Mazur what I don't understand or I reveal to Professor Mazur what I don't understand, there's a good chance that we'll do it in class the next day. Could you just come up to the mic, please? Yeah. Monica, go ahead. Hi, thanks for being here. I'm Monica Higgins. I'm the faculty here. And I started teaching and learning uh, by the case method over at Harvard Business School, where I started the faculty in 95. And so the way that uh, we were taught is I'm just very curious about this two-step process. So it sounds as though there's some theory or something that, or something that students read, and then there's the assimilation, kind of one, two. And you might take that out of the classroom and put the assimilation piece in. So. Interestingly, I'm just interested, you know, your reactions to this, the way that we kind of were brought up in this particular mode of case teaching is the students should grapple with something, not the theory, not the answer, not the lecture at all. In fact, it's a case that's an example. So start with the example, come to class, discuss around, facilitated, heavily facilitated by an instructor, and then at the end of class, or maybe not even that class, maybe at the end of another class, they get the article to read about the theory or they get the professor's PowerPoints or something. So it's, it's actually kind of a three-step process. First, emotional engagement, then, you know, discussion with peers, social learning, and then the theory. So I'm just, would be interested yeah. in reaction I'm, to I'm that. I'm really happy you, you mentioned that because in a sense, the case study method is perhaps the earliest example of flip teaching, right? You, 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 you don't have the instructor just deliver the theory or the explanation. No, you have to soon do something before class so that in class you can do something more, more interesting. The big difference between the case study method and what I do, <clears throat> well, there are several, but which, one of which you pointed out, but another major difference is that the case method is a serial process in terms of engagement, right? You, what did you think company XYZ should have done? Do you agree with it, right? So it basically the instructor picks out individual people. It's, whereas in peer instruction, it's one-on-one, -on -one, all at once. Right? One -on -one. Okay. Now, back to your point, which I think is a very important one, and something that I've adopted, actually, in my class. Um, in my class, the, the focus now are projects, which are like cases, but the case extends not just over one class period or a week, it extends over a month. Um, and the project, I, the design principles I use for the project are very similar to the ones that the business school for, uh, uses for its cases, right? One, it has to test the application 
of relevant skills. Two, it has to be in a real world context. Three, I was really surprised by that, but somebody at business school had told me that, it has to have a, comp the, the case has to have a component of empathy or social good in order to intrinsically motivate the students. So basically my projects have all those three features. As a, you know, it tests relevant skills, physics skills. It, um, it um, is placed in a real world context, not, you know, carts on a track or balls rolling down an inclined plane. No, it's the real world and we're surrounded by physics, so it's not that hard. And lastly, you have to offer the students an opportunity to do something that, you know, benefits or, or another option is to have a competition to get that intrinsic motivation going. So you're, you're totally right. I mean, there's more to it than just having them read the textbook. I wish we could talk about all of that, but you know, <laughs> need another hour and a half for that. That's good. Please, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Chong. I'm a first year MBA student <laughs> at the Case Method. Um, I co-founded a education uh, technology uh, social enterprise in China, and that's where my interest in education came from. And the question I have is, in your experience um, helping or, or watching other schools like teachers implementing the peer instruction method, what is the most difficult thing that you found? I think the most, thank you for that question, very good question. First of all, I, this is not about technology, right? We could have done all of this without any technology. I mean, it would have been a little bit of a problem for the remote audience, but I could have asked all of you, instead of clicking a button on the clicker, to put your hand on your chest with your fingers indicating your choice. Right? I would have said, at the count of three, put your hand on your chest was your answer. And I would have told you, if you don't put your hand on your chest, I'm going to come to you with this microphone and you're going to have to tell the entire room what you voted. I, I do that with my students too if I don't use technology and quickly they put their hand on their chest. So it's not the technology, it's the pedagogy. The emotional engagement came not from the clicker, it came from the approach to teaching. But what is the biggest hurdle? I think the biggest hurdle is that most of us are simply not aware that the lecture is ineffective. And I think most faculty at Harvard care very deeply about teaching, but they're perfectly happy about their teaching, and the students are happy about their teaching. I get students every year in my class who think that I'm not doing my work because I'm not lecturing. Well, I hope that by now you've noticed that I love to lecture. <laughs> I just know it's not very effective. So I think the biggest hurdle is a psychological hurdle. One, for instructors to become aware that lecturing is ineffective. And secondly, for students to come to you know, peace with this idea that you know, the teacher shouldn't be lecturing, but really be more a coach or guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. Good, sir, please. So I'm Joseph Williams. I'm a research fellow at Harvard X in online learning. And so I'm, I'm really interested in kind of how you might see the method of peer instruction scaling through digital resources, and in particular, in how we might do experiments um, that would test, you know, what are the best prompts to ask people? So my research is cognitive science work, and I've worked on prompting people to answer questions for reflection, but this seems like a great real world context where now you could ask questions like, which prompts do you ask people to respond to versus to discuss? And I've seen you have a paper out on, or a set of resources on doing it for physics. But maybe as we're thinking about digital resources and online courses or in residential, how would you roll it out to other disciplines? Okay, let's see if I understood your question correctly. Um, how, how could you take peer instruction and basically apply it in an online learning environment? For example, yeah. one, one was video. Um, well, you can do it, but if there, there are two ways of doing it. One is synchronous and the other is asynchronous. Synchronous would require you to somehow find ways of pairing people who might not be together in the same room, right? So you were able to interact with each other by just talking to each other. And you probably talk to the people who are naturally sitting around you. <clears throat> Online, that may be a little bit harder. Although if you look at the Minerva platform, it's kind of interesting how they do uh, connect students in little chat rooms via video and audio. You could do that online. The other way would be asynchronous, and in that case it becomes very quick, very similar to the social document annotation system that I described earlier. However, there's a drawback to that, and the drawback is that 
the reply is not immediate. In fact, it may take a day before, you know, you say, I don't understand this, and then a day later, somebody else says, well, blah, 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 and another day later, a third person says, wait, you forgot this, and then you come back and you think, well, I'm still not completely satisfied. So it draws out these interactions between students over time, and I think there is a benefit to the immediacy. So I think in an asynchronous environment, I don't see it scale that easily. In a synchronous environment, I could see it scale much more. I guess maybe the question is, is there work going on that's doing experiments to test the most effective way of doing that? Because it's a set of prompts to use, but you could imagine using different ones or different approaches. Very briefly, Eric. Well, I mean, I, there's the Minerva project, which I mentioned, and I think there are a number of people who are thinking about how they could, how they could implement it, but I, I think there's very little work being done at this point. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, engaging and thought-provoking uh, presentation today. Um, my name is Richard Monoya. I'm a master's uh, candidate here um, at the Ed School in the Mind-Brain cohort. And um, I'm particularly impressed with your um, uh, emphasis on inquiry-based uh, instruction. And I'm curious what your thoughts, some of your thoughts about um, some of the, the qualities or um, criteria to a great question. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. <clears throat> in fact, you know, I give many workshops on pre-instruction and, and on question design. What are the right questions? Obviously, a recall question would not have been very interesting, right? If instead of the whole, look, you got engaged about that hole in the plate, right? A hole in a plate. Can you think of anything more boring than that, right? <laughs> and, and you got engaged not because of, 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 of the subject, because if I just lectured on it, you'd be falling asleep, right? So I took something that normally would put people to sleep and make it interesting. Now, why did it become engaging? Because it tested the model, right? If I'd asked, which of the following is not a living being, a flower, a rock, a giraffe, you'd have made a choice, and then what? I could have asked you to talk to each other, but you know, how do you argue about this, right? It's a fact, it's not a, 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 a model. So I think good questions at least have to deal with either a mental model or some interpretation. And what I do when I train people to design good questions is that I first give them a series of questions, actually on, on the Pythagorean theorem, because I never know from what disciplines the people who take my workshop come. And uh, these questions range from recall to very abstract applications of the Pythagorean theorem. And I tell people, now, score these questions according to Bloom's taxonomy. How high, what kind of skill is needed in order to answer that question? And then very quickly, you see that questions have a broad range, right? If I have, which of the following is the Pythagorean theorem? A plus B equals C. X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared. Uh, you know, X over, and then some other equations or even non-equations, that would be just recall. But if I say, uh, you know, Joshua is running diagonally across a soccer field, what distance did he run? Now you need to recognize that that has to do with the Pythagorean theorem, and you're applying this in a context that's probably different from what you've learned, so you're at least halfway up Bloom's taxonomy. So basically asking yourself, you know, where you score on Bloom's taxonomy is a pretty good guide of how, what kind of discussion you're going to get inside the classroom. This is good. Now, that's a reminder to everyone to catch up on Bloom's taxonomy, if you don't mm -hmm. happen to remember it. Uh, two final questions, briefly, brief answers, please. Um, hi, my name's Marshall. I work at HarvardX. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was really informative. I'm just wondering if you could suggest an empirical method to determine um, an absolute minimum amount of content to teach students, because I do think one of the implications of uh, your your work is that um, we shouldn't emphasize content as much as concepts. And uh, I'd like to find a way to balance that um, in terms of what is presented to students. Okay, I would have phrased your question a little bit differently. I would have said probably, well, first of all, how much content I cover is irrelevant. What, what, what is really much more important is how much content the students master, right? Take my lectures, I covered all the content, they learned nothing, right? So it's not about the quantity of content covered by the instruction, it's about the content uncovered by the students. But actually, I would say it's not the content that really matters. It's the skills. 
when I'm teaching physics to people who are going to go on in different fields, I don't know what physics they'll ever need. Mm -hmm. right? They may become pre-meds, they may become engineers, they may become electrical engineers, whatever. I don't know. They may even get jobs that don't even exist today. 20 years ago, if somebody would have said, I need a web programmer, I would have had no clue what that person was talking about. Right? We're training students for jobs that we don't know. So it's not the content, it's the skills, it's what people can do. And if you look at myself, I'm working in nanophotonics. When I did my graduate work, there was no nanophotonics. When I did my postdoc work, there was no nanophotonics. Everything that I need to know now, I taught myself afterwards. So it's not the content, it's the skills that matter. A good book to read is Understanding by Design by Grant Wiggins, which really makes you think about the outcome rather than the input, the output rather than the input, right? The input is the content, the output are the skills. We should really think about the skills, not the content. That's great. Final question, please. I'm Erin Walzuski. I'm an attorney, and I teach the lawyers at my law firm how to be lawyers. And starting in the spring, I'll be teaching at Harvard Law School. Uh, so I have a two-part question, but I promise both are very short. Once you switched over to this method, is it 100% of your classroom time that you use with this technique? And second, you mentioned that 30 to 70% of people getting it right the first time is really the sweet spot. Uh, how do you find, or what's your process for developing questions that fall within that range? Okay, so when I teach in a space like this, yes, 100% of the time is basically about teaching by questioning. My new classroom is a flat space and we have all kinds of different activities. This would be one of them. But it's, everything is student-centered. In fact, I can't even lecture in that room because there are whiteboards that are obstructing the view from two and a half of the students. Question efficacy should be somewhere between 30 and 70 percent. Initially, of course, you never know where you're going to be, so it's something that knowledge that you develop over time. However, research done at the University of Colorado, not by my own group, but the University of Colorado, has shown that even if you have some questions outside of that range, it still primes the pump. It gets students to think. Right? You'll still be thinking about that hole in the plate, and you still learn something you know, by what I've added to, to the discussion afterwards. Now, in a real class, I would have asked you another question about that same subject in a different context, further reinforcing it. Here we just did one question. Right? So, so I would say, if you're teaching this way, don't fret too much about it. Ideally, between 30 and 70% get it right. If it's really only 10% that gets it right, abort the question, explain it, and do it again with a different question. If 100% gets it right the first time, don't have them talk to each other because they're quickly going to get off task and ask a harder question. So typically, I walk into the classroom with a stack of questions and then see how it goes. Erica, thank you. A closing question and then we will uh, uh, wrap up. Kind of think of this maybe as a, as a sort of a benediction. Um, and that's, has, how has all of this work you've been doing for years now and, uh, you know, kind of traveling around the world sharing these ideas, how has that changed your personal life in terms of just the way you think about work and kids and students and learning? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, well, first of all, you know, I... I didn't develop peer instruction thinking I'm going to invent peer instruction and change the world. <laughs> I had a problem to solve in my classroom. I found that my students weren't teaching, weren't learning, and my teaching was ineffective and I had to do something about it. And then I got really excited that it worked and I started working on it. Then I submitted a proposal to the NSF to get some funding and I, discovered, and I thought, hmm, I need a trade name. I thought, peer instruction, I don't like that very much. I called in a postdoc, we brainstormed, and it was seven o'clock, it had to be in FedEx, so we wrote down peer instruction. And I would never have imagined that 24 years later, I'd be talking here at the Ed School <laughs> about education and, and that I would have traveled the world talking about it. So it's come as a, as a surprise. I mean, and, and it's been very gratifying to see how people at, at all different educational levels and in many different disciplines have uh, latched onto it. But really, in the end, I think it was not planned. It was pure serendipity. I think, I don't know what got into me to just tell my students in the classroom, discuss it with each other. I'd never done that in the science center. And when I, when I saw the effect, I, I thought, wow, I gotta try this. And you know the rest of the story. I do, and it's the result is a lot of changed lives for the good. Uh, Dean Ryan, would you like to 
declare the gathering yeah. to a close.